Imagine a world where loyalty is tested, power is absolute, and secrets are buried deeper than bodies. Welcome to the chilling saga of Frank the Irishman Sheeran and the infamous disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. Today, we're diving into one of the most enigmatic mysteries in modern American history. A tale where a powerful union leader vanishes without a trace, leaving behind a web of conspiracy that has puzzled investigators for decades. Based on Charles Brandt's explosive book, I Heard You Paint Houses, we'll unravel the dark and twisted story of Frank Sheeran, a man who climbed the ranks of the Mafia and allegedly held the key to Hoffa's disappearance. From mob hits to political intrigue, this story has it all. So buckle up and prepare to enter a world where loyalty comes at a deadly price. Let's explore the sinister underbelly of organized crime and the fate of Jimmy Hoffa that continues to captivate the nation to this day. The final fate of Jimmy Hoffa remains one of the greatest mysteries and conspiracy theories in modern American history. What happened to him? How did he seemingly vanish into thin air, never to be seen or heard from again? One person attempting to answer this question is Martin Scorsese in the film The Irishman, a movie based on the biographical book I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brandt. Frank Sheeran, who allegedly claimed responsibility for Hoffa's murder, was at one point one of the most feared Irishmen in the Mafia, involved in violent activities associated with the organization. Frank Sheeran, a close friend of Jimmy Hoffa and involved in union crime, is, according to the same book, believed to have collaborated in one of the most shocking events of the 20th century, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Frank Sheeran was born in Derby, Pennsylvania on October 25, 1920, to Irish Catholic parents. He avoided trouble in his youth and had a quiet and modest childhood. He enlisted in the army during World War II and served in the military during the war. Sheeran was stationed in Catania during the invasion of Sicily, a small detail that would help him in the future. On October 24, 1945, he returned home and took on small jobs, usually as a truck driver or security guard in local bars and union halls. Around this time, he met Russell Bufalino, an important member of the Bufalino crime family. One day, Sheeran had engine trouble with his truck and stopped at a rest area where Bufalino happened to be. Bufalino saw the imposing young Irishman and approached to help Sheeran. Sheeran later said of Bufalino that he was the closest thing to Marlon Brando's portrayal of the Godfather that one could find. He described him as very polite and soft-spoken. Bufalino was impressed with Sheeran, partly due to the fact that Sheeran had served in the same part of Sicily where he was born, Catania. Their relationship flourished, and shortly afterward, Sheeran was introduced to a close friend of Bufalino named Angelo Bruno, who was a prominent member of the Philadelphia Mafia. Bruno would later rise to become the boss of the Mafia in Philadelphia. In 1959, during this period, Sheeran was asked to help with small tasks, such as collecting loans and delivering messages. However, it wasn't until an incident with a man named Whispers that Sheeran was asked to commit a murder. Whispers had lent a significant amount of money to a laundry business, but the owner of the laundry was having trouble paying the debt due to a rival competitor named Cadillac, who was taking most of the business. So, Whispers asked Frank to sabotage Cadillac and put them out of business for good. He asked Sheeran to keep this strictly secret and not to involve anyone else in the job. Sheeran agreed and, in the following days, scouted Cadillac 
before carrying out the task. Subsequently, Sheeran was summoned by bosses Buffalino and Angelo Bruno to a local bar run by Philadelphia gangster Felix Skinny Razor Ditulio. Sheeran knew he was in serious trouble. He had seen the warning signs. Whispers asked Sheeran to keep this strictly secret and not to involve anyone else in the job. Sheeran agreed and, in the following days, scouted Cadillac before carrying out the task. Subsequently, Sheeran was summoned by bosses Buffalino and Angelo Bruno to a local bar run by Philadelphia gangster Felix Skinny Razor Ditulio. Sheeran knew he was in serious trouble. He had seen the signs. Senate hearings on organized crime were underway, with Italian Mafia members being called to testify, and Sheeran knew these men were not to be taken lightly. With some nerve, he proceeded to explain the situation to the bosses. Bruno was then visibly upset and revealed that he had a stake in Cadillac, which put Sheeran in serious trouble. Sheeran told Bruno that Whispers had ordered him to do it and to keep it secret. After a back and forth, and with the tension mounting, they decided to give Sheeran a chance. Bruno told Sheeran to handle it, and that he already knew what was going on. The next day, Whispers was found shot dead on the sidewalk. The relationship between Sheeran and Buffalino continued to flourish. Later, Sheeran was introduced to Jimmy Hoffa over the phone. Hoffa's first words to Sheeran were, I heard you paint houses, a euphemism for killing people, as later titled in the book mentioned at the beginning of this video. Sheeran confirmed this and also said that he did his own carpentry work, another euphemism for referring to disposing of bodies. Hoffa took a liking to Sheeran, and from that day on, Sheeran became a close friend and bodyguard of Hoffa. He helped Hoffa run local unions and resolve union disputes, generally through the use of force. The bond between Sheeran and Hoffa grew so strong that Sheeran became close even with Hoffa's family, especially his daughter Peggy. From a young age, Jimmy Hoffa was a union activist and eventually became an important regional figure with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Around the age of 25, in 1952, he became the National Vice President of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and served as its General President from 1957 to 1971. He secured the first National Trucking Rate Agreement in 1964 with the National Master Freight Agreement. Hoffa played a significant role in the growth and development of the Union, which ultimately became the largest in the United States by membership, with over 2.3 million members at its peak. During his leadership, Hoffa became involved with organized crime, a connection that continued until his disappearance in 1975. He became one of the most powerful men in the United States during the 1950s and 60s. In popular culture, he is known as one of the major adversaries of the Kennedys. One theory suggests that Hoffa was involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy, but there has been no conclusive evidence pointing to this. By the way, speaking of the Kennedys, the book I Heard You Paint Houses also touches on the following theory, which has not been officially verified. According to the book, Robert Kennedy was a thorn in the side of organized crime. As Attorney General, he had been conducting investigations into the Mafia and took a particular interest in Jimmy Hoffa's activities. Hoffa was outraged by these investigations. Other mobsters, such as Carlos Marcello, Santo Traficante, and Sam Giancana, were also targeted. A plan was reportedly devised to kill Robert Kennedy as a result. The Mafia decided that if they killed President John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy would lose his power and halt all investigations into Mafia activities. According to reports on Buffalino's orders, Sheeran 
was responsible for ensuring that the weapons to be used in the plot were loaded onto a plane bound for Texas days before the president's visit to Dallas on November 22, 1963. Ultimately, President Kennedy was shot and assassinated in Dallas, Texas. In a moment from the movie The Irishman, the crime boss Russell Bufalino, played by Joe Pesci, says, if they can take down a president, they can take down the president of a union. This line directly relates to the famous conspiracy theory that the Mafia was behind the assassination of President Kennedy. In the end, Scorsese decided not to include Sheeran's account of delivering the weapons in the film, mentioning that they didn't want to delve too deeply into what could be speculative or controversial details. Scorsese mentioned that they wanted to explore the nature of who we are as human beings, the themes of love, betrayal, guilt, and forgiveness. He didn't want to cloud the emotion and power of what was happening. In 1967, Jimmy Hoffa was sent to prison for bribery and fraud. During Hoffa's incarceration, Sheeran spent much of his time managing certain unions and maintaining order for Hoffa. Bufalino then called Sheeran to handle a matter in New York. Joe Gallo was a dangerous gangster and a member of a rebellious faction within the Colombo family. After being released from prison, he reportedly organized an attempt to assassinate the Colombo family boss, Joe Colombo. The Mafia bosses were unhappy with Colombo's activities, as he had been the head of the Italian-American Civil Rights League, giving public speeches and conducting interviews with the press. This level of publicity was too much for a Mafia boss. Consequently, some of the bosses decided to eliminate Colombo. Despite the plan, the hit was executed carelessly as it was carried out in broad daylight and in front of Colombo's family at an Italian-American Unity Day rally, which was against the rules of Cosa Nostra. Colombo's loyalists sought revenge for the murder and Gallo kept a low profile after the hit. However, on the night of his birthday in 1972, Gallo celebrated with family, friends and a bodyguard at a restaurant in Little Italy in Manhattan. Gallo sat with his back against the wall in the restaurant and after a few drinks, he let his guard down. It was then that Sheeran entered and positioned himself at the bar in front of Gallo. After a few minutes, Sheeran left the bar, approached Gallo's table and began shooting. Gallo's bodyguard was injured while Gallo ran toward the exit, trying to draw fire away from the group. Sheeran caught up with Gallo outside and fired additional shots at him. Sheeran then left with an associate who drove them to and from the hit. There are conflicting accounts of the assassination of Gallo. Some reports implicate four members of the Colombo crime family who burst into the restaurant and carried out the hit under the orders of the acting Colombo boss, Joseph Colombo. On the other hand, Former Colombo family, Capo Michael Franzese, disputes that Sheeran was the assassin. He comments on the scene depicting the assassination in The Irishman, pointing out that he knows what really happened based on his personal involvement with the Mafia during that time, including his time in prison. Hoffa had a dispute with a close ally named Tony Provenzano, a captain in the Genovese crime family. The dispute was over. Pension payments for union work that Provenzano believed he was entitled to, but Hoffa refused to honor the payments due to Provenzano's conviction. It is said that there was a physical altercation in prison where Hoffa and Provenzano fought. On December 23, 1971, Hoffa was released from prison when President Richard Nixon commuted his sentence. Although, on the other hand, some sources indicate that there were bribes involved, with Nixon allegedly being involved. 
According to U.S. Department of Justice and White House officials, Hoffa's release was granted with the condition that he not participate directly or indirectly in union activities until 1980. Fearing this restriction and aiming to regain the presidency of the union, Hoffa claimed that he had never accepted such a condition and filed an unsuccessful lawsuit to overturn the stipulation. However, Frank Edward Fitzsimmons, the current union leader of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and backed by Tony Provenzano, supported the government's position. But Hoffa had other plans. He wanted to remove both Provenzano and Fitzsimmons from the path to clear the way and regain the presidency of the Teamsters. Hoffa intended to publish a book accusing Fitzsimmons of selling out to the mob and granting large, low-interest or interest-free loans from Teamsters pension funds to companies. While this was happening, Bufalino and Sheeran went to New York to meet with the underboss of the Genovese crime family, Anthony Tony Salerno. Salerno controlled a large number of unions and stated that, while he would support Hoffa's presidential campaign, he would not interfere with Tony Provenzano and Fitzsimmons. After other setbacks in the campaign and threats against Fitzsimmons, Hoffa began publicly accusing the Mafia of being involved in the Teamsters Pension Fund. Hoffa claimed that under Fitzsimmons, loans from the Pension Fund to the Mafia for purchasing casinos in Las Vegas were not being repaid. He stated that once he was back in charge, he would confiscate the loans and take control of the casinos. By 1975, Hoffa's relationship with the Mafia had deteriorated beyond what he could have imagined. Due to this, Bufalino and other bosses decided it was not a good idea for Hoffa to run for the 1976 election and communicated this decision to him in a meeting. But Hoffa simply ignored Bufalino's request. Understanding the situation, Bufalino calmly asked Sheeran to try to convince Hoffa not to run. He explained that people had a serious problem with Jimmy. It was here that Bufalino mentioned that if they could eliminate the President of the United States, they could certainly eliminate the President of the Teamsters. Following this, and reluctantly and quite annoyed, Jimmy Hoffa agreed to meet and settle things with Provenzano. He needed Tony Provenzano and the rest of the Mafia on his side if he wanted any chance of winning the 1976 election and, more importantly, surviving. Understanding this, a meeting was scheduled for July 30th, 1975 in Detroit, where Hoffa was to meet with Provenzano. A few days before the meeting, Bufalino informed Sheeran that Hoffa had to be eliminated and that Sheeran was to take care of the matter. Sheeran realized that the job would proceed with or without him and that refusing would also mean his own death. He had no choice. Before the scheduled meeting time, Sheeran drove to a house in Detroit where the hit was to take place. A member of Tony Provenzano's group, Salvatore Brigulio, was there to receive him. Presumably, part of Provenzano's crew was present for the cleanup and body disposal operation. Charles O'Brien, Hoffa's adopted son, picked up Sheeran and Briguglio from the house and drove them to a nearby restaurant. They picked up Hoffa, who was furious. He had been waiting for half an hour in the restaurant and he hesitated about getting into the car. But knowing his trusted friend Sheeran was by his side, he got in to go to the meeting place. Hoffa walked a few steps ahead of Sheeran as they entered the house. Hoffa saw no one. It was a trap. As Hoffa turned to head toward the door, Sheeran shot him twice in the head. It was the end of Jimmy Hoffa. It was claimed that the body was taken to a nearby crematory a few days after the disappearance, although it would always remain shrouded in mystery. 
Hoffa's adopted son knew about the plans, but repeatedly denied it. When publicly accused in an interview, he denied any involvement in Hoffa's disappearance and said he didn't believe the mystery of his death would ever be resolved. He expressed his frustration, saying he saw Hoffa as a father figure and that he was just a child when Hoffa took him and his mother in. It's very frustrating. I have so much inside. My love for him and his family, said Charles O'Brien. Hoffa was president of the Teamsters from 1957 to 1971. The FBI has stated that his disappearance is related to his attempts to regain power within the Union. Hoffa was known to have intended to testify before a special Senate investigative panel about the Mafia's involvement in U.S.-backed plans to assassinate Cuban President Fidel Castro. O'Brien told the press that he was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1933. As a child, he moved to Detroit with his mother after his father abandoned the family. O'Brien's mother became friends with the Hoffa family when Hoffa became president of the Union. O'Brien became Hoffa's special assistant at the age of 23, and Hoffa treated O'Brien with such affection that many people thought Hoffa was his biological father. Sheeran and Buffalino went to New York to meet with Tony Salerno to tie up any loose ends regarding the murder. Tony Provenzano was also at the meeting and Provenzano claimed that Sheeran knew Hoffa wanted to eliminate both him and Fitzsimons. However, ultimately, Buffalino had a calm conversation with Salerno and the dispute was resolved. A few days after Hoffa's disappearance, Sheeran visited his ex-wife Mary to leave money. His daughter Peggy was there and she could see the expression on Sheeran's face knowing that her father was involved in Hoffa's disappearance. It was the last day Sheeran would see his daughter. In 1978, the Mafia suspected that Salvatore Bregulio was cooperating with the FBI. The normal protocol was that if a mobster went to the FBI headquarters for any reason, he had to inform his captain beforehand. However, Braguglio had visited the FBI headquarters without notifying any of his superiors, and now he was marked for death. Sheeran and an associate were watching Braguglio as he passed by the restaurant in Little Italy, the same place where, supposedly, Sheeran had attacked Gallo six years earlier. Sheeran and the associate approached Braguglio. Sheeran greeted him and then shot him twice, while the associate fired three more shots into Braguglio's head. It was the end for Salvatore Braguglio. In 1980, Sheeran was acquitted of the charges. In 1981, Sheeran was acquitted of murder charges, but a year later, he was convicted of a series of crimes and was sent to the Federal Correctional Institution in Minnesota, where he stayed for the rest of the 1980s. In the early 1990s, he was transferred to the Federal Correctional Institution in Springfield, Missouri, where he reunited with his lifelong friend and mentor, Russell Bufalino. Anthony Salerno was also there, serving a life sentence for extortion. In 1991, Sheeran was released on early parole for health reasons. In 1995, Sheeran was sentenced to 10 months in prison for violating his parole after having a drink with the Philadelphia mob boss. On October 10th, 1995, Sheeran, sick and frail, was released from prison. Time was running out for the old Irishman and he spent his last years in care, working on his memoirs with the help of Charles Brand. On December 14th, 2003, Frank the Irishman Sheeran passed away peacefully in a nursing home at the age of 83. Many of his friends described him as an honorable man. Frank the Irishman. Sheeran's story is one of complexity and intrigue within the criminal underworld. 
Despite being an esteemed member of the Mafia, he remained loyal to his criminal circle and declined multiple offers to become a government informant, which would have granted him freedom. His respect among Mafia circles was notable, though he never fully belonged due to his Irish heritage. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more gripping tales from history's underworld. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for watching.